where I came from. Uh, originally, uh, I was an engineer working in microwave and video displays. And about 37 years ago, I came out from the East Coast where I worked uh, in Long Island. It's a wonderful Silicon Valley. Uh, I was probably one of the first field application engineers used by Fairchild. My primary job was to go around and help clients with engineering problem design and applications of semiconductor products. Uh, in those early days, one of the first guys I met, oddly enough, was a guy by the name of Al Alcorn, who was the father of Pong. And I remember in the early days that Al, Nolan Bush, Nolan, a guy named Ted Dabney, had formed a company called Syzygy. That's S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. And Syzygy, uh, the first development was a Pong game that they dedicated as a coin-op game. And they put it in a pizza parlor in Deer Hall on El Camino in Sunnyvale. And lo and behold, it overflowed with coins. At the same time, I was working on a project to build a device which is a coin-operated game that used a microprocessor. A lot of people in the industry swore that a microprocessor couldn't be used in video games, and I knew better. So I accepted the challenge and went out to design one. The name of the game was called Demolition Derby. And some of the unique features of it is that we actually had what we call coin defeat mode, which was a way of timing the coin as it went through the switch closure to make sure kids didn't use slugs or wire to trip the switch down in the machine. We actually had timed the window and had it programmable that this slot time had to be maintained in order for the machine to be activated. We also made controls for it that were optically encoded. Here to four before they were contact switches, they were pots, and the idea was to use optically encoded devices because they were more rigorous and could stand dirt dust in a harsh environment. About that time, uh, I finished the machine. I was working full time for Fairchild, and they contacted me and had a company they were working with called Alpex that was doing something on the same order with the 8080 process. I was enlisted as like a secret agent to work with Alpex in developing it to work with the F8 microprocessor, which was Fairchild's uh, homegrown processor. Uh, the project turned out we ended up using the software, but I threw the hardware away and with myself and a guy by the name of Gene Landrum, we wrote the business plan to write a uh, division for Fairchild which was to go underneath their watch division to make games. Uh, we finished the whole uh, engineering task in a record time. Me and my guys ended up putting it in production in six months. Our management never understood that that was a record time. And we were considered mavericks because we didn't follow the rules of the game. But if we look back for parallel functions, we'll find that many other developments were maverick. Uh, you had to be a maverick to get things done because traditionally uh, there were people there ready to stick their foot out to say that's not the way it's done, it's done this way. Well, when you break, break new horizons, you have to break some rules. And we were rule breakers. We were known as mavericks, crazy guys. Uh, we did things that were really different. Even uh, the engineering department, we used to have uh, contests where we would uh, pop the bottle of champagne and see how far the cork would fly and give an award for it. And we had various contributions sometimes Instead of the mechanical one of doing it, our programming guys would do it on, in software on a CRT. Uh, we had one mechanical group actually make tandem rockets to, to blow the cork in this, up in the air, which ended up disastrous when they hit one of the cars in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other things that were a problem 
is that <coughs> we introduced the thing at the CES show in, uh, I think it was 75. It was an instant hit. Uh, I remember having a booth that was like four feet across that was part of the watch booth. And I couldn't even go to the bathroom. I had to make up a sign and have somebody fill in. We even had a crew of uh, people show up that, that did a photograph of the whole thing in a movie that they wanted to show in Sweden. Uh, the hand controllers were very unique. The guy that actually made them into a reality was a guy by the name of uh, Nick Talisfer and another guy by the name of uh, Ron Smith, mechanical engineering kind of guys and industrial designer. I made the first uh, model of it, the feasibility study, that it could actually be made. Because heretofore, nobody thought of an eight-way hand controller. You can actually pull it up, push it down, twist right, twist left, tilt back and forth and forward and backward. So it had eight axes of control. In order to make it work properly, we had to simulate, since it was a digital contact, we had to simulate it acting like a analog device in software. And the way we did that was when you touch the contact together first, the movement on the screen of any object would move, would move slow and as it would stay, stay in contact, it would speed up in an exponential function. So you got to play with it and use it almost like it was a pot. Some people didn't know it wasn't a pot. So again, here was the power of the microprocessor being used to simulate other things. Our big problem became with the FCC. We entered into the FCC and we failed. And it was a whole uh, educational advance to work with the FCC. At that time, uh, people like uh, Apple had circumvented getting FCC approval because they didn't have an RF modulator. One of the rules that is unfortunate people didn't realize and, and to uh, <coughs> comply with is even an electric razor can be sanctioned by the FCC. If it radiates any noise of a certain level, the FCC can step in and have you disband that sale of that, that device. The reason why they got involved with us is that anytime you build an RF device that is a little transmitter, in order to get approval, the rest of the circuitry comes into play. And very few people fail because the modulator has problems. They fail because the other electronics comes into their own. And where we were failing was we had uh, a radiation signal coming at a harmonic frequency that no matter what we did, we couldn't get rid of it. Uh, one of my guys, Will Alexander and I, I remember many times working until Three hours in the morning trying to eliminate this signal. And finally, one I had an epiphany one day after work until 2 o'clock in the morning. I went home and I was just bugged by this signal. And I called Will instantly, and Will was still up too. And I said, Hey, Will, let's go back to work. I think I found it. And we went back to work, and I said, What is a quarter wavelength of 52.5? megahertz. And he whipped out his calculator, got the half and uh, with the quarter wavelength, the wavelength and length was. I said, okay, now measure that hand controller from the base out to the end, right on the head. I said, uh-huh. We were looking at a spectrum analyzer, and we saw the signal reached over with a pair of scissors and went clip, and went, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> we shortened up the hand controllers by two inches, and no more problems. And we took it to the FCC, and the FCC, again, would play games with it because it was a big political razzmatazz to get through them for a while. And we finally got through, and I was sitting in the lobby every day until it passed. I decided, why should I turn around, go back here, and wait? I'm going to sit there. So every morning, I come to the FCC and sit in their lobby. And finally, after three days, the, one of the uh, Chief engineers there came out to the lobby and kind of fingered, waved, waved to me and said, here's your number, go home. <laughs> I said, we passed, right? But the big uh, interesting thing about the industry was that many people uh, were sitting in the lobby trying to figure out who the Fairchild guy was. 
and I ran out like I guess it's just the in boys town. I'm really feeling good, and ran out the door, and then ran back in the door, and I said, "I'm the Fairchild guy who passed." <laughs> well, from then I went immediately to the airport and got on a plane to fly back here. And by the time I got here, the news had beat me back. Because at the time, the other competitors in the business were all talking about making dedicated games, and they were so afraid of the cartridge concept that it was going to put them out of business. Because instead of having a dedicated game for each function, this cartridge thing that was going to sell for the cartridge will go from 29, uh, 1995 up. It was a big blow to them. And they kept claiming that the only reason is that they won't pass FCC. They won't pass FCC. And when we passed, they had a nightmare. But close on our heels by another year was a company called Atari. Because Atari came and entered the marketplace. Uh, it was interesting, the first year we brought it out, Fairchild was not used to consumer business. They were not used to even making watches. I made a prediction that the watch business is not the sizz of beautiful electronic watches. It's a jewelry business. And that people care less about the intricacies of what's inside the watch. All they care about is what it looks like. And I told that to Fairchild over and over. And they kept saying, oh, no, we got the technology. So technology doesn't sell. Technology is what is, makes the product easy to manufacture, makes it cost effective, makes it sassy, but it doesn't sell the product. Well, first day after Christmas, in the consumer business, it's called Hell Day. And that's the day that all the toys come back to the store because they don't work right, or Mildred doesn't like it, or Junior wants something else. And that's the day that all your customer resources have to be in place to receive calls. Well, our marketing department was rather lax. They took off. And I made the mistake, and since the whole plant was closed, was, well, I can get them caught up on my paperwork. So I went to work. Me and the guard were the only two in the plant. And the phone call started coming. And they came. I had a Hollywood movie star call me and tell me what a great thing it was and how they enjoyed it and what we could do with it. Then they started getting frantic. I had one guy who called up that was really mad because he had taken the game completely apart, all the screws, everything, looking for the batteries. <laughs> And I said, sir, it plugs into the wall. But still, where's the batteries? <laughs> OK. I had one other call. Will dog urine hurt the game? <laughs> dog urine? Yeah. yeah. Schnauzer lifted his leg when he first saw it and let it have a dose, right? We got one one time where somebody cut down. We purposely made this cartridge not the same dimensions as an 8-track tape. Didn't make any difference. They were make it an 8-track tape. And we had people carve down the cartridges and carve down 8-track tape to try to shove them in the machine to play. <laughs> well, you can imagine, since I was not in marketing, I was in engineering, that toward the end of the day, I was getting a little frazzled. And a woman called up, and she said, my game hums! Do you know why? And I said, because it don't know the words, lady. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so you got kind of burned out of shape with all that. But and some of the things that happened were quite amazing. We had a crew of guys, for instance, some of the things that Fairchild Channel has never received credit for. We actually made the first precursor to Pac-Man. It was called Maze. And Maze was a game that it calculated 10,000 different mazes. And it, it, the game was played where two players could go through the maze. And the maze had several modes. One mode is where it was completely invisible. And you were banging against walls and had no idea where it was. Another mode, you actually left a trail. Then the, the guy programmed it, developed another function for it, which was he called it the cat. 
cat would come in the maze and gobble you up. Now, one of the bad points we used to have is that my poor kids to this day, they're now in their 30s, <laughs> they were the pioneers of testing games. I would bring games home for them to play to find the flaws in them. And uh, lo and behold, the kids were making games out of the flaws. And it was funny because you never got the true information back from them. They would make up another game, uh, like they found a way they claimed to get the cat sick. My son told me one time, he was all of about, I guess, three years old, four years old. He used to know where the cat would go. And I said, you can't know where the cat goes. It's random mazes. He says, I know the maze. I said, how do you know the maze? He said, if you take button, the reset button, and you hold button one, and you let go of the reset button, you get the same maze. He was right. Because it never timed out. So he knew the time function. He memorized the maze, and he knew where the cat was going to go every time. He also had a problem with one of the games we called dodgeball. Dodgeball, where we had two squares that were players that balls would come in from all sorts of idea, uh, angles from the screen and uh, collide with you. And the kids found out if you took both players and superimposed them over top of each other, when collision occurred, the blue guy would always get the points. It was a flaw we had and didn't realize. They found it. And they played it. They would holler and I want the blue player. No, I mean, why? It's the same thing. No, it isn't. Right? They knew. Who's that name? <laughs> Where's Dave? Oh, here. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm sitting there checking on some of my notes. You gotta forgive me. I'm half blind these days. Yeah. So uh, some of the other things uh, that Fairchild was responsible for is that we had. TV game that was played over network television. <coughs> and what it was called was called TV Pow. Turns out that in television, uh, particularly local broadcasting, from the hours of around noon to four o'clock is called no man's time. And in those days, uh, local TV stations used to have shows like Dialing for Dollars, or movies where until you know, this time, because their network appeal didn't have any broadcast stations of, of shows they could put on. And in order to make viewers watch them, they had a lot of audience participation shows. One they had us develop was called TV Pow. And one of the games called Shooting Gallery was devised to where it had a hybrid, a hybrid device where we hooked it to the phone line the game had a video out rather than an RF out and went into the, their network video system. When a person called in and wanted to play the game, we would switch that video line over and that screen would be the game. And if they said POW, they would fire a projectile to try to hit the moving target. And if they scored a certain amount, they'd receive a home prize and that kind of thing. The show went on for a couple of years as a fill-in show. Originally, uh, Regis Philbin demonstrated it on TV uh, years and years ago. And uh, a guy by the name of Marv Kaplan was the producer that we produced it for. And he went around selling it to different stations around the country. We also had a system that we devised for loading games over cable TV. We actually had it working over the teleprompter network in 1977. It had a battery of our, our uh, software devised on the system that had a cable box which was housed underneath the channel app and a cartridge mechanism cable which powered the game and powered the, uh, the adapter box. The cable went into the back of the adapter box and you turned it on, it gave you a menu of all the particular games. 
you would select the menu, and this was an endless loop of data. And it would find that particular game, download it, say it's okay, and then play. And it was unattended running for about two years in Santa Clara. Fairchild again couldn't get their act together as to how to deal with it. And then teleprompter themselves changed and uh, fell apart. And I understand people have revived it and said it's a brand new concept. Yes, yeah, brand new. It was working in 1977. Any questions? You guys are quiet. I hear you breathing out there. I got one question.